recently, uh, Luke has been on this kick where he asks everybody what their birthday is. Okay? He also asks how old you are. Okay? So if he comes up to you and says, when's your birthday? And how old are you? Which I'm trying to get him to quit asking ladies that because that's not polite. But if he does that, that's just a, a, recent, a recent thing he's been on. So the other day he was asking me a bunch of questions. Um, he goes, when is Sam's birthday? I told him. He goes, when is mommy's birthday? I told him. And he said, when is Gigi's birthday? I told him. Uh, and then he asks me, when is Scampy's birthday? Okay. Uh, and Scampy is a monster on an app he plays on the iPad. Okay. There's all these monsters on this app and they do counting and reading and all sorts of fun stuff. And Scampy is his favorite monster. And so he says, dad, when is Scampy's birthday? <laughs> He's very excited about this, right? And I said, buddy, I don't know when Scampy's birthday is. When is Scampy's birthday? And he said, it's October the 48th. I said, buddy, I hate to tell you, but October the 48th doesn't exist. And he looked at me and he said, dad, monsters don't exist. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. He's got a point. That kid is always thinking. <laughs> you got to get control, buddy, because I got to keep going. Okay, I tell you that story uh, because we are at a time of year where we spend a little bit of time thinking, okay, where we spend a little bit of time reflecting. All right, it is New Year's. It's a time to think about our last year. It's a time to think about the next year. Uh, hopefully, it's a time to set some goals. Maybe it's a time for you to make a few resolutions. And so at the end of our sermon today, I'm going to challenge you to make a New Year's resolution. In fact, if you notice on your bulletin, uh, there's only one thing in the note portion of the bulletin for you to write down. Uh, we'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, but in order for us to make this New Year's resolution, I want us to look at the life of King Solomon. Okay, so if you haven't already done so, please open your Bibles to your Old Testament, open to the book of 1 Kings. All right, and one of the first things that I want us to remember about the story of King Solomon is that King Solomon had every advantage in life. I mean, think about the way that this man was raised. Think about what happened in his life. Solomon was the son of King David. He inherited the throne of Israel. Really, even before King David died, Solomon started ruling alongside his father. He grew up with every privilege. He grew up not wanting for anything. And not long after Saul became king, God appeared to him in a vision and told him, he said, Solomon, you can ask for anything you would like, and because of the relationship I had with your father David, I will grant you any request that you have. Okay, Solomon could have asked for riches or the death of his enemies or anything he wanted, but instead what Solomon did is he said, Lord, I don't know the best way to lead these people. I don't know how to be a good king. I don't know how to be the kind of king that you need me to be for your people. So I ask for wisdom to rule well. Okay, this pleased God, and God granted Solomon incredible wisdom. I want you to notice 1 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 29. It says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Haman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And I mean, if you're wiser than those guys, you've got everything, right? And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered a thousand and five. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. Okay, in other words, the biggest plant we can imagine, the mighty cedars of Lebanon, Solomon understood it, and even the very smallest things, the little weeds that grow out of the wall, Solomon knew about all of it. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his 
Wisdom. Okay, so Solomon has more wisdom than anybody. He understands the way the world works. He understands how to rule. He understands people. He understands everything that he needs in order to be incredibly successful. Okay, notice also God didn't just give Solomon wisdom, but because Solomon was so wise in asking for wisdom, God said, not only will I give you wisdom, I will also make you fabulously wealthy. Okay, flip over to chapter 10. Notice starting in 23 how wealthy Solomon was. It says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons and spices, horses and mules. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. All right, think about this for a minute. No matter how much wealth you have, you always want just a little bit more, right? All of us dream about having a little bit more money. Okay, Solomon didn't have that problem because if he could even think about it, he could have it. All right, and I tell you this because if you look at the blessings of Solomon, if you look at his wisdom, you look at his wealth, you look at his position as king, you look at everything he had, even including his relationship with God, there is no reason that Solomon shouldn't go down in history as the most successful person who ever lived. Solomon literally had everything he needed. Anything he could have wanted, he had it. He had every advantage. There is no reason that we shouldn't look back and think of Solomon as the most successful person who has ever lived. Right, And we will get back to Solomon in just a minute. But part of why I emphasize this point is because I believe that in many ways, just like Solomon... We too have every advantage we need to be completely successful. Okay, I want you to think for just a minute about how blessed we are as a people. We are an extremely blessed people. Right, and you may be going through some things in your life right now that lead you to not feel all that blessed. Right, and I'm not trying to gloss those things over. I know many of you struggle with some very real problems, and I'm not trying to make light of that in any way. Okay, but I think about some of the amazing advantages that we have as people living today over other people in other places or people living in other times, and you realize that we are incredibly blessed. Right, think about just a few of the ways that we are blessed. Okay, in the first place, you are incredibly blessed this morning just by the fact that you are sitting in church worshiping God. Right, think about what percentage of the world has never even heard of Jesus. Okay, numbers on that are impossible to come by. Okay, but some of the estimates say that about two-thirds of people living right now have never heard the name Jesus Christ. You are part of a select, blessed people who know Jesus Christ. Okay, and what percentage of people in the world, even if they've heard of Jesus, have grown up in an environment that was hostile to Christianity and really becoming part of a church wasn't one of the options that they really had with their lives? You were born into a situation in which you could hear the gospel and put in a situation where Christians surrounded you and loved you enough to teach you about the faith. You get to come and worship Jesus anytime you want to, freely, without any fear of persecution or retaliation. That is an advantage that most people in the world do not have. You are a blessed person this morning. Okay. In the second place, you are also incredibly blessed because you live in the United States of America. Okay. The USA certainly has some issues. We're not a perfect nation by any stretch. But you are blessed to be in a country where you have options and opportunities that most of the rest of the world can't even imagine. You are blessed to be here. You are also blessed because you live in an age in which the world is literally at your fingertips. Most of you right now could pull a phone out of your pocket and look up anything you possibly want to know about anything. 
you live in the information age. Your smartphone can get you more information in 60 seconds than a college education can pour into you in four years, right? We marvel at the wisdom of Solomon, but imagine if someone had walked up to him and shown him Google, okay? You are blessed. And I think one of the biggest advantages that we have that we don't often think about and we just take it completely for granted, but we are blessed as a people living today to have access to the Word of God. Okay, for centuries, even if you happen to live in Europe or Russia or somewhere that practiced Christianity, the only time you would have seen a Bible was when you heard the parish priest read a passage from it to you. Okay, and chances are, if you lived in most any other age, you wouldn't have been able to read, even if you had a Bible. The idea that everyone could own a Bible is an extremely recent development. Now, you can go to any computer or phone or tablet and pull up any translation that you possibly want, and with two clicks, you can get any passage of Scripture right in front of you that you can read anytime you want to. We are an extremely blessed people. All right, this is a very short list of our blessings, right? I'm hoping that we could spend the rest of today and the rest of our lives just counting the blessings that God has given to us. Okay, but my point this morning is that you have abilities, you have options, you have resources that are frankly amazing. You have every advantage you need to be successful in life. We read in the Old Testament about King Solomon and we think, man, he had every advantage. There's no excuse for him not to be extremely successful. I look at us and look at our blessings and think there's no reason we can't be completely successful. Right? Is that fair? Does that make sense? All right, back to Solomon. Because even though Solomon lived an incredibly righteous life, even though he had wisdom, even though he had all these incredible advantages, Solomon had one major fault. Notice chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David, his father, had done. So the tragedy of Saul's life is that in spite of all of his advantages, in spite of his wisdom, in spite of his wealth, in spite of his access to God and God's word, in spite of his knowledge of what was right, Solomon ultimately failed to give himself fully to God. We won't read the rest of Solomon's story this morning, but if you remember from Bible classes the rest of the story of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel is ultimately torn in two because of this one sin problem that Solomon had that he struggled with his entire life. Because of one sin problem, the entire nation of Israel was almost destroyed. You know, before Luke was ever born, Everything in his body was completely fine and normal except for one very small thing. A one valve in his heart between the two right chambers of his heart didn't form correctly. Okay, and that valve, even on an adult, is incredibly tiny. Okay, on on Luke, before he was born, was so small you couldn't see it without a microscope. Okay, everything else in his body was perfectly fine except for that one little valve. But because that one little valve didn't form right, it caused the rest of his heart not to form right, which caused his lungs not to form right, which caused his trachea not to form right, which eventually led to problems with his liver and his kidneys and his gut 
and every other major system in his body has taken a hit because that one little teeny valve didn't form correctly. One extremely small little problem has caused him a lifetime of hospitals and doctors and abnormality. One little valve. All right, here's my point this morning. Okay, Satan doesn't have to get you involved in every sin. Okay, Satan doesn't even have to get you involved in the worst sins. Okay, yeah, Satan would love for you to become a mass murderer. Satan would love for you to become a serial rapist, okay? But that's not most of our temptation, right? That's not where we're going. We are basically good people who try to do what's right. Okay, Satan doesn't have to make you a monster. Okay, instead, what Satan will do is he will find one small thing in your life that keeps you away from God. He will find one small struggle, one sin that you don't want to get rid of, one habit, and he will use that struggle as a way to keep you from becoming the person you could be. Okay, Satan will use that one sin struggle, and through that, he can cause havoc throughout your entire life. It doesn't take everything. It takes one thing. You know, maybe for you, it's your marriage relationship. Okay, you haven't figured out how to put your spouse first, and Satan will use that not to just ruin your marriage, but he'll make you miserable throughout your entire life. He'll take that one problem and blow it up. Okay, maybe for you, it's an attitude towards work or money. Okay, you're tempted to work too many hours or maybe you love money too much and maybe greed is your thing and Satan can use just that one thing to not just ruin your work life, but he'll ruin your entire life. You know, maybe for you it's gossip or a complaining spirit. Okay, neither of those really seem like that big of a deal, but they will ruin your relationships and drag down your life. Okay, and just like one faulty heart valve, that one seemingly small thing will lead to further and further problems throughout every system in your life. All right, so here's where I'm at this morning. Uh, when I was getting ready to preach for this week, I thought about coming up with a list of resolutions for us to make, right? I had a whole list in mind, right? I want you to resolve to read your Bible every day. I want you to resolve to pray every day. I want you to resolve to be nice to your preacher every week, okay? I had a, a good list going of things we could resolve to do, but I decided not to go with that sermon this morning, and instead I want us to just try to focus on one thing. Okay, and here's where that space at the bottom of your bulletin comes in this morning. Okay, rather than try to focus on a whole list of resolutions, I want us to focus on just one thing. You know, I've been listening to some Dave Ramsey on the radio recently. Anyone else listen to Dave Ramsey, he's got some pretty good financial advice. And one of the things he talks about on his radio program is that often we get into financial trouble when we try to do all of our financial goals at once, right? If you're trying to pay off all your debts and save for retirement and do all of this stuff all at the same time, then you don't ever really get any traction on anything. Okay, instead, he's come up with his baby steps. Okay, and you focus on each step one thing at a time, and then you can start getting some real traction in your finances. Right? I think the same principle can apply to our spiritual lives. Right? Rather than think of about 30 different things you want to work on for this next year, what I want you to do is think about one thing, think about one spiritual goal that you can make for yourself this year, try to focus on that one thing, and we can get some traction moving forward in our lives. Okay, so what I'm asking you to do this morning is I want you to pick one spiritual goal for yourself this year. If you're comfortable writing it down on your bulletin, go ahead and do that. If not, just hold that in your head. Okay, I want you to pick one thing that you are going to fully turn over to God in 2016, and I want you to focus on that one thing. Is that fair? Everyone knows what your homework is? All right, and then the next question that I have for you is this. Okay, what is something practical that you can do to get traction on that one thing? Okay, what do you need to actually do to turn that one thing over to God fully? All right, a lot of different things that we can do to try to help ourselves spiritually. Okay, scripture gives us lots of things. One thing that we see several times in Scripture is the idea of helping each other stay accountable. Right? Maybe what you need to do is help 
somebody, have somebody help you stay accountable to that one thing? Is there somebody that you can go to and talk about this one spiritual problem you're having and have that one person regularly keep you accountable? Okay, is this something that you need to pray over every day? Maybe you make it a part of your daily prayer time to pray over this one area of your life. Maybe you need to remove a certain temptation. Maybe you need to remove a certain relationship from your life that is keeping you away from God. Is there one particular time of day or one particular person that you're with that tends to lead you into this one area that you would like to work on? Maybe you need to change that temptation, change that relationship. You know, for many of us, what we really need to do for that one area is we need to actually repent. Okay, not just say, God, I'm sorry, I won't do this thing again. But instead, actually go and try to make some restitutions to people we've wounded. Maybe actually try to go back and try to try to fix some of the things that we have broken because of this one sin problem. Maybe we need to repay some debts. What does it look like to do something to practically get some traction on this one thing? You know, one of the struggles that we have in my house um, currently is that I have a two-year-old who doesn't like going to bed. And what tends to happen with my two-year-old is he will get out of bed and he knows what's going to happen. I will ask him, Sam, what happens when you get out of bed? He says, I get a spanking. I say, okay, you're out of bed, so what's going to happen now? Get back in bed. Okay. He keeps getting out of bed expecting that something different will happen. Okay. Nothing different happens. He gets one little swat, which he thinks is like crushing all of his hopes and dreams. And then he gets back in bed, but then he'll try it again, right? He'll get out of bed a few minutes later. We put him back in bed, one little swat, cry, cry, cry. He keeps doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? Which is the definition of insanity, right? But in our spiritual lives, what do we do? We say, well, I'm going to get better in this one area, but we don't actually change anything. And then we expect we're going to get better results and draw closer to God. My challenge to you this morning is think, what is something I can actually change so that I can get some different results in my spiritual life, in my quest to grow closer to God Almighty? All right, so please take this seriously. Think about one area in your life you would like to turn over to God more fully in this new year. And I want you to think for just a minute with me about what your life could look like one year from now. All right, if you can fast forward, now we're at the very end of 2016. What do you want your life to look like? What do you want your relationship with God to look like? What will it look like for you to be more Christ-like, more spiritually developed, have a closer relationship with God Almighty at the end of 2016 than we do today at the end of 2015? All right, at this time in our service, we're going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. During the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. Um, if there's something you'd like to talk with us about or pray with us about or study with us in Scripture about, we would love to help you. Um, this song is a time for you. If you have a need, please come talk to us now while we stand and while we sing.